Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. My guest today is Vicki Bean. She's a professor of law at the New York University Law School and the faculty director of the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy. And we're talking about the Fair Housing Act, important achievement legislatively in the 1960s, capping a decade of civil rights achievements, this in the area of housing. Uh, a, a law that Lyndon Johnson rushed to pass following the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And it's been 50 years, and uh, although there's been some progress when it comes to fair housing, there still is a lot of work to be done. And Vicki walks us through both the goals of this important legislation and some of the complex issues that cities and communities still face when it comes to segregation of neighborhoods and desegregating the way we live in our cities and towns. So this is an important and very interesting topic. I hope you will enjoy this episode. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Good Law, Bad Law. On this episode, we're going to talk about fair housing. It is 50 years since the Fair Housing Act was passed, signed by Lyndon Johnson just a few days after the assassination of Martin Luther King. And to help us work through where we are 50 years later with fair housing in this country and with the goals that the Fair Housing Act was intended to fulfill, I'm joined by Vicki Bean, who is a professor of law at the New York University School of Law and the faculty director of the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy there. So first of all, Vicki, thank you so much for being on the program. Thank you for having me. Uh, this is, this is a, a fascinating and a hugely important topic that I confess I knew very little about and know very little about going into this. So I'm really looking forward for myself as well to understand this better. Um, an important piece of civil rights le legislation from the civil rights era of the 1960s and a promise that, as I understand from some of your writings, remains largely unfulfilled. And in particular comment you made to the Department of Housing and Urban Development, which is looking at some aspects of the Fair Housing Act in which you said, integration has remained elusive uh, in the five decades since the passing of the Fair Housing Act. So that's where I want us to get to, is to really understand that uh, and the importance of that. But uh, first, Vicki, if, if you would, uh, give us some background on yourself. Uh, you, per, you know, personally, how you came to the law in this area and some background on the Furman Center as well. Great. Well, again, thank you um, for having me, and thank you for your interest in this topic, which is a critically important topic that we don't talk enough about. Um, but I, I came to this issue. I, I have taught um, at NYU Law School now for uh, longer than uh, than I want to date myself. So uh, <laughs> let's just put it that it's been a long time um, and have been one of the faculty directors at the Furman Center for about 15 years. Um, I had the, the pleasure and the privilege of uh, taking a, a leave of absence to serve as uh, Commissioner of Housing uh, uh, Preservation and Development at, for the City of New York for oh. three years in uh, between 2014 and 2017. So had to grapple with these issues uh, up close and personal, both right. as a theoretical matter in my research and as a uh, you know day-to-day -day implementation matter uh, serving uh, as commissioner. But you can't really think about housing in New York City or in any place in the United States, um, nor can you really think about land use patterns without grappling with fair housing and what our obligations are and, and what the goals are that we're trying to achieve and how to get there. So it's been a long-term uh, research interest of, of the Furman Centers. It's been a long-term research interest of, of my, my own and, and my colleagues at the Furman Center. The Furman Center is a joint uh, center, so it's interdisciplinary. We take lawyers mm -hmm. and put them together with 
uh, planners and urban economists and try to get the both the best of of both of those worlds really um, so we're a very evidence based um, uh, research organization that tries to figure out well what's really happening on the ground and then what are the appropriate policy and legal responses based on what we know, um, what the hard evidence shows about what's working and not working on the ground. So we um, we have a team of about uh, 13 uh, full-time people, and then we really leverage off of the incredible talent at uh, NYU Law School and NYU Wagner School, and indeed around all of, um, of New York University. So we draw on students from sociology, economics, um, social work, uh, in addition to law and urban planning, and and try to put together a really um, solid interdisciplinary team to study some of these problems. Well, it, and this is, uh, again, to, con- to confess my own uh, ignorance, and I agree it's, it's, it is so incredibly important, but I think when people think about the major landmarks of civil rights legislation, they think of you know, non-discrimination in public accommodations. They think of voting rights, uh, the Voting Rights Act. But I, I don't know that enough people, certainly, or most people, think about housing. And so it, it was passed in 1968, and here we are 50 years later. So I think this is a great opportunity to to give us a little bit of a history lesson here and the background on this important legislation uh, so we can understand how much progress there's been or how much lack of progress there's been uh, and where we can go forward, where we should be going forward from here. So um, I'm going to task you with that <laughs> to get us started, Vicki. Um, the Fair Housing Act, to give us, give us a little background on that, where it came from and uh, what its major uh, goals were uh, at the time it was passed. So it really came from, I mean, during the civil rights era, um, both you had, um, you know, the riots in Washington, D.C., the riots in Newark, um, and other places really highlighting the horrendous uh, living conditions and neighborhood disparities between white neighborhoods and predominantly uh, black and Latino neighborhoods. Um, and those riots led to um, the appointment of what was called the, you know, the Kerner Commission, um, mm-hmm. which is the famous commission that said um, something has to be done or we're headed to uh, two societies, one black and one white. And there had been proposals to address housing discrimination in Congress for many years that had been stalled. Um, they were a priority of Dr. Martin Luther King. They were a priority of the civil rights movement, but they were getting nowhere in Congress, blocked primarily by, um, you know, Southern Democrats at that time. Um, And it was really the assassination, unfortunately, of Dr. Martin Luther King that led President Johnson to say, we've got to do something and we need to do something fast and we need to do something that shows that we care about the the inequities of the neighborhoods in which um, people of color live versus those in which whites live. So the Fair Housing Act was passed very quickly after Martin Luther King's death. And it was, um, in many ways, it, it mirrored the kind of legislation that had been passed that you referred to, the mm-hmm the rules against discrimination in employment, the rules against discrimination in the expenditure of federal funds, Mm -hmm. those kinds of things. Um, So it prohibits explicit discrimination. So if I, uh, you know, go to rent an apartment and I'm told or I believe that uh, I'm not being rented an apartment that's available because of the color of my skin, because I have children, um, because of my gender, because of of my ethnicity or race, then I have a cause of action under under the Fair Housing Act. But what's remarkable about the Fair Housing Act is that it not only said you you housing participants in the housing market cannot discriminate um, against people of color and and some other uh, protected classes, but it went further than that in it in that it acknowledged the role that 
the federal government, in addition to state and local governments, had played in segregating neighborhoods, right? And well, so, that's, that's the that's that is the fascinating thing, and I think I think we need to spend another minute or so on the non-discrimination piece because I think it would be easy to imagine that the type of situation we're talking about is limited to one landlord discriminating against one potential renter of an apartment, let's say. But, and and that certainly did go on. I mean, I, I, I remember from my history reading that, you know, there were, there were signs, you know, coloreds need not apply or, you know, Jews need not apply for a particular uh, apartment, let's say an apartment building. But that kind of overt really out in the wide open kind of discrimination uh, was one thing, but there was other, also evidence of systemic discrimination going on, lines being drawn around certain neighborhoods or certain communities to prevent uh, integration, to prevent mixing of, uh, particularly mixing of blacks and whites in neighborhoods by mortgage companies, by uh, big landowners, by developers, and so on, right? That that was a huge problem that had to be addressed uh, head on by this by this legislation. Well, and it wasn't only the mortgage brokers or the developers, but it was the the governments themselves. So how so, there was how a long so? His, so there there was a long history. Really, it used to be back. Um, in the uh, before the great uh, migration to the north of many African Americans, that that whites and blacks lived not not in equal um, neighborhoods, but interspersed in neighborhoods, and and part of that was the in in the north. Part of that had to do with you know your your um, housekeeper, et cetera, lived nearby. Um, in order to get to work nearby, so there was a mixing of of blacks and whites, although it wasn't equal, and it certainly was divided by income and and many other things. But after the Great Migration to the North, where you saw this influx of African Americans, whites began to be very um, nervous about that very you know mm-hmm. uh, showed antipathy, and so the first line of really explicit and very um, outright discrimination was that city zoning laws zoned parts of town to be for whites and parts of town to be for blacks, and in some cases, parts of town to be for uh, Latinos or Asians. And it was illegal for you as a black person to buy a house, for example, in a white neighborhood. It was illegal for whites to buy in black neighborhoods. Um, Wow. And that was um, very explicit. There was a team of of zoning experts whose job it was to go around the country and write zone explicitly racial zoning ordinances. the The Supreme Court struck those down. Um, and what then happened in in response to the Supreme Court striking them down is that you cities and and people turn to private agreements to achieve the same thing. So when they built, when a developer built a new uh, subdivision in a suburb, for example, they would put into the um, the documents for that subdivision what, what's called a covenant, which is you know essentially a contract that, um, that binds future owners of the land as well, that they would not sell to a black person or a, or, or a wide range of, of folks. To and maintain so, the to maintain the racial or ethnic makeup of of that development. Exactly, exactly. Yeah. And then the the Supreme Court held that it was um, illegal for courts to enforce those explicitly racial racist um, uh, covenants. So, in yet another response to that. Um, zoning and credit practices, et cetera, adopted less overt but no less powerful ways of discriminating against people of color. So, um, 
you instead of saying, well, only whites can live here, um, you would zone for, you know, one acre or two acre zoning so that you would automatically keep out people with less money, right? And because of the correlation between class and race, um, that was an effective, that was a pretty effective way of mm -hmm. segregating neighborhoods. The federal government then, um, you know, got in on the act as well by um, by redlining, as you referred to. Mm -hmm. So the the homeowners loan corporation, which was the federal agency that basically had to insure the mortgages, um, re, uh, drew explicit, worked with local um, uh, you know experts in every jurisdiction to draw explicit red lines around neighborhoods that were considered to be quote unquote more risky um but what that meant more risky to lend to but yeah. what that actually meant was that it was um uh communities of color uh communities of that were poorer and those neighborhoods were a red line was drawn around them and the federal government said we will not guarantee any mortgages that you a private lender make in those neighborhoods because we consider it too risky. But what that did is cut off all credit for, um, you know, neighborhoods in which uh, many of the people were people of color. Um, so all of those were extremely effective, um, decreasingly overt, but no less effective ways of um, of keeping uh, people of color in one kind of neighborhood and, and white people in another kind of neighborhood. Um, and the more, you know, one avenue got shut down or got challenged in court and shut down, there would be other ways that cropped up to accomplish the same kinds of things. So, and we're talking, we're talking so far about housing and access to housing and, and the ways in which that impacts the composition of neighborhoods uh, and ultimately we're going to be getting to issues of outright segregation versus desegregating and in integrating neighborhoods. But uh, you, I know that this is more than just about housing. It's more than just about the roof over your head and your, the address where you live, right? You you know that uh, I think can speak to this from from your perspective of working with all of these other uh, professionals from different backgrounds um, at, at, with your work at the Furman Center, that this is the impact of these housing uh, uh, decisions and how, how neighborhoods are zoned and how people are kept out of or locked into certain neighborhoods has brought it, broader implications than just where they live, right? Can, can you talk about that just a little bit? What some of the impacts are on on individuals and families because of this absolutely so i mean where you live the the zip code in which you live determines lots of things about your life chances it determines the quality of the schools that you go to it determines the amount of crime that you face in your neighborhood it determines the kinds of resources that are devoted to that neighborhood in terms of parks and and other you know essential amenities it 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 determines the kind of job opportunities that you have. So mm -hmm. where you are living um, determines much more than what kind of house you have. It determines all of these ways in which your future is going to be shaped, not necessarily determined. Lots of people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, even in the poorest neighborhoods, achieve amazing success, but it it limits, it shapes, it constrains and blocks people's opportunity. Um, and I mean, for, I can just give you a couple of examples, but, um, you know, growing up in a highly uh, racially concentrated, you know, a, a neighborhood where the proportion of, let's say, Latinos or Blacks is much higher than the proportion for the city as a whole. And you have, so, so you have a disproportionate makeup of one race and you also have you tend to have with that uh, uh, concentrated poverty as well growing mm -hmm. up in that kind of neighborhood 
has as great of an effect on how you how a child does in school as missing an entire year of school. Um, so that's a you know huge effect on the the life chance because obviously how you do in school determines many many other things about your life. Um, seeing we we've done work at the Furman Center. My my colleague Ingrid Allen, along with Pat Sharkey, a sociologist here at NYU, uh, and Amy Ellen Schwartz, uh, an education specialist, have done work on how exposure to violence affects the school per, the performance of kids in school, and finds that you know if you are witnessing murders, other you know horrendous crimes, you of course do much more. You, you don't do as well in school, right? Your mm -hmm. mind is elsewhere. Um, so they're just in every way, your health, your education, your exposure to crime, your your exposure to networks that can help you get jobs, all of those things are are tied to where you live, the neighborhood and where you live. And so it's not just about do you have a quality house. It's about all of the chances that you're going to have in life. Well, and so so coming back to the Fair Housing Act then, I mean, it seems from 2018 perspective, certainly obvious that, uh, it, that this law should prohibit the kinds of explicit and systemic uh, acts of discrimination in housing. We've given some examples of that, whether it's the government zoning or the mortgage companies lending or the land developers, including racially uh, oriented covenants uh, and so on. Uh, but, um, but there's more to the Fair Housing Act story than simply ending overt discrimination. And that's the part that uh, I want to turn to because I think this is a little harder to see and understand, which is a uh, a law that has as a goal not only ending discrimination but but fostering integration and and mm -hmm. desegregation. So help help me understand how it set out to do that and what what type of success we've seen in that regard. So so that's what's remarkable about the Fair Housing Act is that it doesn't just ban uh, discrimination by private actors or by government actors, but it, it recognizes, it explicitly recognizes that because of the long history of racial segregation in housing and because of the long history of government's involvement in that, that it wasn't enough to just say from hence from here forward we're not going to have any discrimination you were still yeah. left with a society that was completely divided and so, it reminds me of the school desegregation example too that you can't just declare one day we won't discriminate in in public education but meanwhile you still have all these all black schools and all these all white schools and if you don't actually do something about that, the problem is going to continue. Exactly. So the the Fair Housing Act included a provision that required HUD, the Department of Housing, the Federal Department of Housing and Urban Development, to make sure that it and any state and local governments who got money from it, which is most, um, must do what's called affirmatively further fair housing. Mm -hmm. So not just end discrimination, but affirmatively work towards fair housing. And for, you know, basically decades, that was left, um, shall we say, unattended to. Um, in the very early days after the Fair Housing Act was passed, um, Mitt Romney's father, secretary, okay. who was then secretary of, of housing and urban development, proposed to put real teeth in that and proposed that if jurisdictions, if, if local jurisdictions were not affirmatively moving to integrate their communities in the way, as you described, we, we tried to integrate schools, that they would lose federal money for highways, sewers, et cetera, all the things that the federal 
government helps local governments fund. Um, and that was met with a huge outcry from local governments, um, and it was basically shelved. And then... Um, well, what does that look like? Because, and, and I know we have to go back to George Romney, Mitt, Mitt Romney's father in the 70s and the 80s and the 90s afterwards. In terms of school desegregation, I think most of us understand that that means busing. That you have to you have to find ways to bring black school children to white schools and white school children to black schools. You can you can do that with a bus. How how you know how do you put teeth into this affirmatively further idea when you're talking about where people live, where they rent and own houses and live in neighborhoods? So one way is that people where people live and how they own houses is is terribly constrained by um, land use regulations. So, for example, if a land use regulation says, as many, many, many did, that in areas where you have single family homes, no apartments are allowed, then mm -hmm. that's going to continue to segregate by income and because of the correlation between income and race and ethnicity, it will also have the effect of keeping um, uh, people of color out of those single family neighborhoods. So the first thing that it means is you've got to look carefully at your state and local regulations and make sure that they are not inadvertently or, or on purpose um, uh, continuing to segregate even new housing. Right. And well, see, then, then you get into, but then you get into all the NIMBY arguments, and I know that's mm -hmm. uh, something else that you've looked at very closely when it comes to land use and and the patterns of uh, these issues that we're looking at. NIMBY, not in my backyard. I mean, it, you could have, you can imagine a neighborhood of homeowners who say, "I'm not, I'm not opposed at all to having." a black family or many black families or Latino families in my neighborhood, but I don't want an apartment building on my block or because that's going to affect the value of my home. And that, so that I'm just, I'm not saying that some of those people might not also actually have racially motivated views about things, but it becomes harder to separate that out, doesn't it? And becomes much more complicated. It is much more complicated because um, there are any, you know, I, I believe in land use regulation. I, I, I teach it. I believe in it. Um, but it can, uh, it's very hard to separate out whether a land use regulation is intended to protect the environment, to protect um, people's housing values, all of those things, or if it is actually intended to you know, effectuate discrimination, or if it isn't intended to do that, but it has such a strong effect um, along racial grounds that it it accomplishes that, whether it's intended or not. So it is a very, very thorny issue. Yeah. Um, people have legitimate reasons to want to um, preserve a particular way in which a neighborhood has developed to preserve its the nature of its downtown, the nature of its housing, that people have a obviously very legitimate interest in preserving the environment. All of those things are perfectly legitimate um, goals and perfectly legitimate interests. But, but at some point, they can also be used to mm -hmm. preserve the what what was an explicitly segregated um, uh, building pattern. Right. And so it's a very difficult thing to untangle um, what you're going to allow and what you're going to say. Well, we understand that the environment is important, but so, too, is achieving fair housing and achieving a chance for people of all races to live in neighborhoods that are, you know, have good schools and low crime and, and other uh, essentials. I know. I know. Looking at, at neighborhoods and and uh, patterns, uh, or you know, demographic patterns in neighborhoods. What is the number of 
uh, white families in a neighborhood relative to the city overall, let's say, or, or uh, you know, black families relative to the proportions overall, you do see, uh, and, and, and I'm getting this from your writings, which you were kind enough to send me ahead of time, Vicki, but I know you tend to see, for instance, looking at New York City, that uh, you have areas of affluence which then correlate to higher proportions of segregation and color sameness, if that's an understandable term, within that neighborhood. So you have an affluent neighborhood in New York City, for instance, that's higher concentration of white residents than in the overall city's population, suggesting that there is still pretty profound segregation in neighborhoods when you look at race. Uh, but as families do, as, as Black families, Latino families, and other minorities do make it up the income ladder, are they finding, because the overt, explicit discrimination barriers are now gone, hopefully most, you know, hopefully gone in practice as well as in law, uh, is there greater access to neighborhoods uh, than there was before be because of the withdrawing of these barriers? So I don't want to overstate the withdrawing of those barriers. I mean, there no. is still um, tremendous evidence of uh, overt discrimination um, and and new forms, right, as, mm -hmm. as things like home sharing platforms or you know, roommate matching apps or those kinds of things um, become ubiquitous. We're we're seeing all kinds of ways in which they are reintroducing some of the discriminatory patterns that that we saw in the past. So, and and one of the issues about um, you know revealing overt discrimination is that people have learned to use code. They you know, they, they don't say, I'm not going to give you an apartment because you are X. They they come up with some other reason for it. Um, and discrimination has become more sophisticated. I mean, there was a case in which, um, you know, it, it was proved that all of the um, people who answered the phone were trained to recognize the race and ethnicity of the person speaking because of their accent, their speech patterns and that kind of thing. So, you know, I don't want to pretend as if it doesn't still exist. It does. But but your question really goes to, are we seeing as um, people of color uh, achieve, you know, greater economic success? Are they um, achieving also greater opportunity in terms of housing? And mm -hmm. yes, to a certain extent, but what's what's still frightening and what's still so powerful, I think, is that people of color of all income levels um, fa live in neighborhoods that have much lower opportunities in terms of good schools, low crime, et cetera, than, um, than, than do whites of all income classes. So, for example, the the shocking um, thing in New York City, and it applies to many other cities, but I, I know New York City best, is that the average poor white in New York City lives in a neighborhood with better schools, lower crime, and other opportunities than the average New Yorker of all income groups. So the average poor white lives in better neighborhoods than the average New Yorker of all income once you figure in race and, and ethnicity. So, so it's not the case that just achieving economic parity will, you know, will result in integration. Um, and of course, achieving economic parity is incredibly difficult when you've got a history of not being, not being given access to credit. So you can't buy a house to build the wealth that whites were routinely able to build, right? And if you haven't, if that generation didn't build wealth and have a home that has a lot of value that can be used to get a mortgage to pay for the kids to go to college, then that next generation doesn't do as well. And so, 
you know, catching back up economically is an enormous challenge. Um, and even if we were able to catch everybody up economically, there would still be a very significant legacy of racial segregation. Um, so we have to do more than that is what I'm saying. Right. And that's, and it's still, I still see the greatest gray area in all of this is in this idea that, uh, cities and and towns and municipalities have to affirmatively further fair housing because um <clears throat> uh that's that's requiring government to do something and and then the question is well what is the something that they need to do what what can what can government do what should they do what will it work if they do it i mean all those questions come up and uh so I'm I'm still not clear, you know. I, I'm just imagining anybody who lives in a in a neighborhood of homes, uh, of single family homes, would I think understandably resist uh, a low income apartment building being added to their neighborhood for reasons that could have nothing to do with uh, with with race or ethnicity or anything else. So what, I mean, what then do you think, and, and I know the issues are different looking at a big city like New York and Philadelphia where I work and other, uh, other big cities and, and uh, areas that are outside of a city, but uh, perhaps starting with looking at our big cities in, in this country, what are thing, what can be done from a housing perspective to uh, deal with the disparities in in neighborhoods beyond, you know, strict enforcement of the anti discrimination provisions of the Fair Housing Act. What are some of the things that you think affirmatively can be done? So the, the kinds of things that affirmatively can be done is that when you are building, um, to be sure that you are allowing for a range of housing types. And I, mm -hmm. I understand that, you know, people who live in a single family uh, neighborhoods will resist a, you know, a 25 story building. Of course, you have to mm -hmm. do things that are in scale, but, um, but, you know, the difference between a one family house and a two family house is not that great, but it doubles. Mm -hmm. Uh, the density. And so, and there's lots of, I was wandering around Philadelphia with my daughter who lives there um, this weekend. Oh. And, um, you know, you see in block after block, you see a house missing or, you know, a, an empty lot. Those can be built on and made available to lower income families, um, which often are going to be um, I'm not always ob obviously, but um, are going to open up opportunities for lower income families, for families of color to move into those neighborhoods. And if you can double the density, you decrease the cost and that right. allows you to put in, um, you know, to, to allow lower income people to move into those neighborhoods. In many neighborhoods in, in Philly, in many neighborhoods in New York City, for example, you see that the houses that are occupied by people of color are often terribly in need of repair. Um, and those families were often not allowed to take out the kind of credit that's needed to fix the roof or, you know, repair the siding, that kind of thing. But by making sure that in your jurisdiction, those loans are available, and help is available to those homeowners to fix up those houses and keep them fixed up. You can you can prevent that entire block from becoming so blighted that it has to essentially be knocked down, mm -hmm. right, um, and rebuilt. So um, we can do a better job of making credit available and dealing with the fact that because of the legacy of discrimination that. Um, people of color do not have the kind of resources that whites do. You know, the average white family has 40 times the wealth of the average black family, right, in the United States today. So making credit available, it not, not 
overly generous with credit because we know the kinds of problems that that led to in the in the 2007-2008 period, but right. making responsible credit yeah. available, helping people fix up their and maintain their homes, helping people move into new homes that are built in in neighborhoods that are now predominantly white or predominantly uh, higher income, all of those are relatively painless ways of achieving change. Well, and I remember when I first moved to Philadelphia, I was so impressed uh, at that time with uh, then gov- uh, then uh, Mayor Ed Rendell, who later went on to become Governor Rendell, who talked about the loss of manufacturing jobs in Philadelphia and the number of jobs lost was in- enormous. It was something like 250,000 manufacturing jobs over a 25-year period he was talking about. And the impact of that on neighborhoods, uh, you, you know, is, is just uh, possible to to fathom today. So, I mean, I think that to the extent cities are thinking about neighborhoods and and housing, it has to go hand in hand with how they're thinking about their local economies too, because people need jobs in order to. Uh, have money to make repairs on their houses or to get better credit or to pay taxes to the city that then provides services to that community. So, I mean, that, that seems, that's not exactly a fair housing initiative, but it certainly bears on it uh, and how all these things are interconnected. And most, um, I mean, the, the better housing agencies today realize that it, it, you know, it takes, action on all fronts. Housing affordability is not just about the cost of housing, it's also about people's incomes. And so when you um, build new housing, be sure and train people to do that construction work so that they get better jobs and and skills that will uh, take them into better career opportunities. But also, um, in addition, I mean, you you posited the question of, well, what do we do in these neighborhoods that are single-family neighborhoods and that may resist additional density or that kind of thing? But also, we have to repair the neighborhoods that we've left behind, right? It's mm-hmm. not a question of moving everybody out of neighborhoods that they may love. Well, many of them do love their neighborhoods um, and have worked for generations to improve those neighborhoods against the discrimination that those neighborhoods faced. But so we need to also invest money in making those schools better, making transit available so that people can get to better jobs, making, uh, bringing crime down in those neighborhoods. So it, it, it's really a, what, what we housers call a both and approach. Mm-hmm. You have to both open up opportunities in the neighborhoods that are now predominantly white, and you have to um, improve and bring the kind of uh, improvements that the people living in um, neighborhoods of color now want to make their neighborhoods a place that they want to stay in. And it, it takes both of those, and it takes a tie to job creation, job training, transit strategies, and everything to get people to better jobs. Well, we had uh, we had Maria Fuscarinas on on the podcast a couple of weeks ago. She's the I don't know if you know her, but she's the executive director of the National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty. Mm-hmm. And uh, she talked about the the uh, lack of access to low income housing as the biggest contributor to homelessness in our country. And so there's a there's a strong connection to what we're talking about here too that. Uh, whether it's uh, renovating, you know, putting dollars investment into neighborhoods, and I know the neighborhoods in Philadelphia you're talking about, there, there are quite a few of them that are begging for investment to rejuvenate uh, those neighborhoods by uh, renovating those properties and those streets. Um, whether it's that way or in the way new uh, housing, uh, some of it low income, is built and developed for. Uh, communities, there has to be access to affordable housing. I mean, otherwise, we will see increases in uh, poverty, we'll see increases in homelessness. uh, And as you uh, have written about, we're going to see a continuation in the segregating, in the segregation uh, 
uh, state of our communities as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing that I think is critically important on the homelessness front, which which applies more generally as well, is that many people become homeless because of a rel of a shock to a system that doesn't have a lot of play in the joints, right? So somebody gets sick and can't work for two months, but they don't have two months savings to mm -hmm. tide them over, right? Right, right? And so one of the things that that we are really trying to think about at the Furman Center is how do you provide, you know, basically transitional relief to say, okay, you you lost your job or you got a divorce or you you fell ill. Um, and you're behind, how do we keep that from leading to your then getting evicted and then becoming homeless? And once you're homeless, you it's harder to get a job. And, you know, it just snowballs from there. And nobody should should end up in that in that snowball rolling down the hill to disaster when you could have prevented that by extending them two months of a loan or whatever. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and so we have to, I think, imagine the the role in which ha the role that housing plays in this in a different way um, as a source of stability and not a source of instability that can then cascade into all kinds of other consequences. And um, and that's not just talking about homeless shelters either, right? You're talking about thinking how a city can plan for those kinds of moments in people's lives, which do come, which do happen, and we know they do. Uh, so, uh, are you are you saying that 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 is, is it could be a priority of cities like New York, Philadelphia, Chicago, and L.A. to have that type of transitional service available, including housing? Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Or not, or just keeping a person in their home, right? Extending mm, yeah. a yeah. a loan to somebody or extending a grant to somebody. It's cheaper to pay a back rent on somebody who's fallen ill, for example, than it is to house them in a homeless shelter. So why yeah. not, you know, and, and obviously there are, you know, there are huge challenges in designing any program like that, but, but we, we have this idea and it goes back to what I was saying about white families having so many more resources than people, than families of color. If, you know, if you have two months, savings in the bank, then, you know, you can weather a, a shock. If you don't, then you can't, and, it, and then it starts to snowball into worse and worse and worse circumstances. So let's stop that snowball from happening um, by finding ways to loan people money, cover, you know, a shortage, help them build uh, savings accounts that can help them weather those kinds of you know, life happens, and and that's what we're dealing with. Right. Well, v Vicky, does uh, does the Furman Center have a, a website that you want to share in case people want to go uh, and get more information about what we've been talking about, some of the articles Absolutely. you've written? Yeah. Absolutely. So it's just FurmanCenter.org, um, and uh, you know we have all kinds of our research, all kinds of data about um, the state of segregation. Um, uh, state of integration. Um, so, so uh, absolutely, we would love to have people, and we have uh, uh, twice weekly newsletters and and one thing and another that people can sign on That's to. That's great, fantastic. Well, we've been we've been talking about uh, the Fair Housing Act. It's 50 years since its passage in 1968, and the enormous challenges that uh, that uh, we all face, that big cities in particular face in terms of uh, housing and, and desegregating neighborhoods. Uh, and Vicki, uh, uh, who's with NYU, New York University Law School, and the Furman Center for Real Estate and Urban Policy, thank you so much for being on the program and for uh, sharing this with us today. I appreciate it. Thank you. It's a pleasure.